we will continue with our system. So we were talking about this uh, system. So infinite bus, uh, uh, one generator connected through the infinite bus through this line, but the, the model for the generator is the two axis model. So we have four differential equations plus the algebraic representation, which is given by this circuit. So we worked on that last class and we were building the, the code. Okay. I put this in Canvas so you can follow this with me. Um, I make some changes. One of the part that we didn't get any solution, uh, as I was saying before, there was a line of code here in which I invoke again the solver after we calculate for the short circuit and after the phone was clear, I forgot to delete the previous equation we have when I invoke the solver and I was overriding the solution. So I delete that part and now we can simulate and that's what we obtain for a given critical clearing time. And here I put all the variables. Um, we can have a better plot if we plot one variable at a time. But you can see here that there are some variables with this very strange behavior. What kind of variables those are going to be? Look at this green line here. This is related to one of the variables. This is very negative, decrease a little bit close to zero. And at this point, spike again with a positive value and then move along. What kind of variable that could be in our model? We have four state variable and two algebraic variables. Current. Do you agree with that? What about the other students? Can this be a current? If so, why? Again, which are our variables in the model? We have six variables. We have four state variables. EQ prime, EV prime, delta omega, four state variables. And then we have two algebraic variables, IQ and AV. What kind of variable is this one in green? So we have a suggestion here. Is my V one of the currents? Is it the current or not? Maybe the question for the quiz, I will go and change it. <laughs> As a conceptual question. At this point, you should know something that we have talked already. And this is the reason why we have a two axis model, not the classical model. So David, why do you think this is uh, current? Um, I think it's the, the vertical line when it spikes up again. So I think, I don't know what the clearing time is, but when the fault is on. Uh, I, I think it's 0 0.3. That's when we have the change. So that's when the, the fault clears, right? Um, yes, we have the fault at the beginning, time zero, and the fault is clear at 0 0.3 seconds. Yeah, so I thought that maybe during the fault, as the electrical power is going down, current's going down, and then right when you re, when you clear the fault and reconnect the system, uh, then current spikes again because it has somewhere to go. It is now connected to the load. Okay, so we have two types of representation, state variables and algebraic variables. State variables are related to a physical phenomenon related with some energy stored in a component. Like in an inductor, the current through the inductor will be related to the energy stored in the inductor. And we know, uh, for, because of physics, this is in this world, we cannot have drastic changes in the car. 
because the, the energy cannot have drastic changes. A drastic change can be the current being one amp and all of a sudden is 10 amp. What can happen in, if we just look at the inductor? No, because there are some energy involved. But we made an assumption. What do you think, uh, David? Well, based on, we did talk about early on about how we do have an assumption that voltage Mm -hmm. So the assumption was that the amount of energy of all our components are different. Some are going to be very large, like, like the energy is stored in the rotating masses of the synchronous generator. That is related with the motion. You have an inertia, a lot of energy. But if we compare that with the energy of some the magnetic field, for example, the, 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 an inductor, the current going through that, that energy is very, very small. In comparison, uh, one is insignificant. So our assumption is, let's neglect this. Let's assume that that energy is not significant. It's a small zero in comparison. And then that current now can change in intensity. So that's our assumption. What you see there is a current that changed discreetly. That must be the current in our machine. And we have two currents, IQ and AV. Look at the other variable here in blue. It's one or the other. Yeah? Yes? So is that kind of like when it changes, um, like on the energy curve or the, the electric power versus the. Magnetic? The electrical, the le yes, yes. The electrical power in the classical model, at some point I mentioned, this is an algebraic representation because the electrical power will instantaneously change uh, if we have some short circuit, for example. And one of the options was, instead of having just differential equation, was to treat the electrical power as an algebraic equation with the variable. That was one option, but for simplification, because we did have an explicit expression for PE, the electrical power, we plug, we plug the thing in the differential equation and we reduce the model. But in general, like in this two axis model, it's very difficult to do that. And that's what we're going to do most of the time for the power grid. For each machine we add to the system, you will have a state variables and algebraic variables related to the machine. On top of that, we will have algebraic variables for the grid. And this is what you mentioned, David. So for the grid, we will have that voltage of the grid can change instantaneously. If there is a fault any change, the voltage can change at any time, take a different value. Yes? Oh, I was saying, maybe I'm not getting this, but why is exactly, is it the ratio, is it a comparison between the energy stored in the mechanical aspects of the grid versus the energy stored in the inductive capacitor elements. But why is it that if the mechan if the inertia was similar to the energy stored in the capacitor, then that, could we not make that assumption? No. And so why would it be that the inertia changing would then uh, it's not just the inertia, is the energy involved in in that physical process, whatever it is. At the beginning of this course, I started with a very simple example. A car driving in the highway and next to the highway, a train going, passing by too. Both of them, they have kinetic energy stored. They are moving, but it's at some point they have to stop. Let's, let's assume they both stop at the same time. The car will, if we pay attention to the train, the car, we will see that <laughs> stop almost immediately, right? Because the train will take, I don't know, a minute. Yeah. So that's why if the inertia is smaller, you have a very light train, maybe a toy train. I don't know, very small. If both is, is stop at the same time, probably they will be comparable. The energy involved in them will be similar. And if we, we need to simulate that or model that, you need to consider both of them simultaneously. So the model for that case should be a set of purely differential equation. 
no algebraic equation. But when we have these different, different behaviors happening at different time scale, something that is very fast and something that is very slow, we can make this assumption. What is the alternative if we don't want to make the assumption? Well, we need to simulate and use a very time, a small time step that will be able to give us a solution for this very fast dynamic. And that will take a long time. So that we don't like that representation. For the power grid, that is called electromagnetic simulation. When you pay attention to the millisecond time scale, we, we care about electromagnetic simulation. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very important subject as well. But if you're going to put that together with electromechanical dynamics, which are the ones that we're studying, you'll see more then, oh, yeah. So it, when you have this electromagnetic and electromechanical, we will focus on the electromechanics. It's, it's like we're going to stand on the train and see what, what is the behavior of this. And what when we look at the electromagnetics, we will assume that those are really fast because that's not a bad assumption. If look at the time scale here, this happened in a matter of almost two seconds, what we have in the plot. Electromagnetic behavior, there is just milliseconds already converged in a very a small fraction of time. Yeah, that's what we're doing for the currents in the machine. Why? Remember, we have a model for that. And the model in a steady state is this one. That's a model for the current in the stator of the machine. IV and IQ are algebraic variables. There is some dynamics related to the stator here, the flux in the stator, those are very fast and we represent them by algebraic model. But again, on top of this, you will have the grid and the grid also will have that behavior. As you said, David, voltages are the vastest in a grid. That's also something we need to consider. Do we need to do that in this case? How, how many? Algebraic uh, description do we need here? So you have for the current IV and IQ. Do we need something for the voltage here? Yes or no? Well, did we include it or not? No. Why not? Because you already have your voltage at both your excitation and your uh, V2. Which is even, which is fixed. Yes. It's a fixed reference. Yeah. So for this particular case, we don't need that. Yeah? But in a more complicated grid in which you do not have that simplified description, then you will need to have the same algebraic equation, but we need to use a terminal voltage. In that case, we know the terminal voltage in a complicated network. Yeah, but you need to solve the grid first. How? Power flow then in that representation, we will need to also determine the voltage. And the equation of the grid will help for that. That's the second example we want to simulate today, OK? Any question? Quick question. So if you go back to the MATLAB plot, why doesn't it go back to, um, if we assume at time zero, that's when the fault happens at the equilibrium. Why doesn't it go back to equilibrium? What's going on? It, it, it is going, but at the, we need more, time. more time. Yeah, if we simulate longer, you will get there. Okay. Let, let, let's do it just to, just to see what happens. 30 seconds. So after we clear the fall, okay. there, yeah, so it, it take a little bit longer. We're going to tweak this. Why? Because we are engineer. We're trying to, for example, we need to specify the protection scheme in this system. And for the protection scheme, we need a breaker. We, we need to have some uh, relays and measurement that can be sent to send a signal to this breaker to open the contacts if needed. 
uh, but there are different technologies, different type of breakers that are faster or slower. And we need to make sure that whatever breaker we have, uh, this is going to operate at a good time. What is it going to be a good time when the machine is still stable? We are not going, to, we're going to have rotor angle stability. So for that reason, it's very important for us to study what is the critical clearing time? Because we need that for the specification of our protection scheme. So uh, we are going to tweak this code. And look, I'm not going to change anything because this code, uh, we have all the uh, script already to calculate the initial point and the simulation during the, the short circuit with the a set of equation, differential and algebraic equation, and also the equation when the system, the fall is clear. But there is one parameter we wanna change and simulate for different parameters, and that is the clearing time. So instead of using here, when we first invoke the circuit, we're going to take this and define a variable. What is the variable? TCL. It, the time for the clearing of the fault. And then when we simulate again, we're going to change this 0 0.3 by TCL. TCL will be a variable. We can call this code as many times we want and specify what is the clearing critical, uh, not the critical, the clearing time for our simulation. So that's what I did here. This is version two. Let me show you the the, the, the changes we have here. So in this case, the simulation when the fault is clear is with that variable. The simulation during the, the short circuit is with that variable from zero to clearing time. And this from clearing time to 10 seconds. So how we're going to put clearing time there? We're going to use it as an input in our side. And we can put as many input we need for whatever you're studying. You mentioned, David, inertia. What about if we can simulate this with different inertia and, and the user just specify, well, what is the inertia of the generator? And we have different results and we can compare. So when I do this now, we will simulate again. Um, there, we should get the same result because the, the, the clearing time is the same. And that is exactly what we get. But now I even put the time here of the, the clearing uh, time. But what about if you, you wanna do something else? Maybe this is 0.35 seconds, then you have a different result. What is one of the questions that I asked you before and we saw that with the equal area criterion, we did it analytically because we were dealing with a classical model and the equation were very simple. In that, in one of the example, we assume that the short circuit send the power to zero, but that's not always the case. But in that case, we were able to obtain analytically an expression for the uh, critical clearing time. In any other case, that expression for the critical clearing time was very difficult to get. But now we can do it with simulation. So what we're going to do here, uh, do you have the code now? Do you make the change? Put the, the uh, clearing time as an input in the function and change the time when we invoke the solver for during the short circuit and when we invoke the solver after the short circuit. So you need to modify this and this and put this variable as an input. Yeah, Did you do it? Are we good, David? You're confused? Are we all on the same page? Yeah, so what we're going to do now, we're going to create a vector, TCL. I'm going to use it in 
uh, capital letters. So this is going to be, because we don't know what is the critical clearing time, we're going to put this from 0 0.3, the system was still stable. And we will change these at the step of 0 0.02 seconds all the way to 0 0.4 seconds. Okay. So that's the vector, TCL. And we're going to invoke our code for all this time. How do we do this? We create a for loop from K, from one to, from one to the length of this vector. Yeah. So K will have different values from one, two, three, four, five, six. From one to six, K will go from one to six. And then we will invoke this, but now this clearing time is going to be read from that vector. So when the K is equal to one, the, the clearing time we will use is 0 0.3. K will equal to, it will be 0 0.32 seconds and so on. Uh, because we wanna see what is happening, we're going to put a pause for two seconds. And then we will press enter. Are you with me? Did you write this already? Enter. As a solution. So far, so good. Uh, the system is getting a stress and instability. We reach instability. We're done with the simulation, and maybe we can go to this plot. We just have six different clearing time. So that's the the plot in part of the phase plane. That's the two variables, delta and omega. And we can see here, we have six points, right, for the uh, clearing time, 0, 3, 0, 4. So the, the critical uh, clearing time must be between the blue and the red line. What is the time for this one? So we have a, yeah, 0 0.36 and 0 0.38, right? So maybe we can do it a little bit smaller here. Let's close all the, the figures and we will get it better here. And we will try to find the critical clearing time. So we repeat this, we change the vector. Now the vector has different values for time. We have more values now. And we repeat for each term value of this vector we have there, we will simulate again. We will put a pause here and we will run it. The solution is at the beginning. This is still simulating. Yeah, so another zoom. It's right there. Yeah, so in that fashion, between those two times, we will have the critical clearing time. We can make the, the put different values between these two points, and then we, we can have a more accurate critical clearing time. And we know that our protection scheme need to respond faster than that. These are very large critical clearing time because you have one machine in an infinite time. But in a real system, this time can be smaller. Are we good? Now, next step, next step. We're going to deal with that system. What are the steps we need to consider? Similar step. First one, equilibrium point. We need to find the equilibrium point. What is going to be the equilibrium point for this system? 
So I'm going to put the system here and we're going to work together on the equilibrium point. And for this, we will use our knowledge of power flow. Some data, some data, the power generated by generator two is 1.6. And the voltage we have is one per unit. Generator three, 0 0.8. And the voltage one per unit. For the load, the power here um, is the load. It's going to be 1.5 per unit active power and 0 0.5 per unit reactive power. And this is the slack bus and the voltage for the slack bus here, D1, is one per unit. Okay. I didn't put B1 here, but let's assume it's one per unit. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we need for the initialization? What are we looking for? Yeah, so we have dynamic simulation and we need to include the dynamic model of these two generators. So we will need voltage and current injected at bus two and bus three. How we can determine that? And now we have a bus TQS here with a load that is consuming this power. So basically we need to include all the power flow equations to determine what is the solution for voltage when you have this injection and this absorption in that point. What technique can we use? We're not going to make it complicated. We can use Newton Rapson. Yeah, and that's the is a technique we like most of the time, and we can develop a code to do that. But this time, because the system is not big, we're going to use Gauss. Okay. So what is the uh, the, the the principle of Gauss equation? What is the key equation? What we're trying to determine? Angle, the voltage angles at plus two and three, and we have the power injection. What about here? And four? Yeah, magnitude angle. Magnitude angle. We have the power injection H. Yeah. For Gauss, uh, the main equation we will deal with is going to be the equation given by the injection of the the, the current at all buses. So you have the current injected at the buses must be equal to the Y bus multiplied by the vector of voltages at the bus. That's the equation. So we're going to 
from each one of these rows, from each one of these equations in this matrix representation, we're going to solve for the voltage. Uh, for example, from the first row or the second row, from the second row, which corresponds to this generator, we will isolate that uh, term that is related to the voltage P2. And that has to do with the diagonal of Y2. And we will isolate that expression and get an expression for that voltage. What is the equation for voltage two? You have a current injected in bus two must be equal to, let me simplify this notation and I'm going to ignore this bus. I'm going to just put I'm going to look at the second row of this equation. So it's going to be Y second row, first column is going to be multiplied by B1 plus the Y bath, second row, second column multiplied by B2 to three and the last term four. So in this equation, if we know how much is that current injected, we can solve for a B2. So from that equation, we will get B2 is going to be equal to this current minus this term minus this term and this one. To solve for this voltage, we need to know how much is this current injected in this voltage B1, B3, and B4. We are going to have similar equation for the voltage bus three and four. Let's write it down, B3. Do you remember this equation or not? This one, the first one. It's fun. Are you familiar with this? Yeah? Okay, so then the equation for B3 should be easy. We just write a similar expression here. It's 3, 1, B1, 3, 2 for the admittance, B2. B3, we skip that one. But then we have three, four, B4. And the last one is for B4. Yeah. So how we're going to solve this using the Gauss technique? To do this, we're going to have an assumption. Typically the assumption is to have a flat start. The flat start is assuming that all voltages in the system are going to be one angle zero. So if that is the initial voltage for all the voltage we have here on this side of the equation, we will replace it here and have an updated value for B2, B3, and B4. With new voltages, we will plug them back again here and we will have a correction. And we will repeat this process, updating voltage, evaluating again, having a new voltage. We repeat this process until we observe that there is no change. If there is no change, we found the solution. But there are two things we need to consider now. One, is what are these injected current? That's the first one. And do we know the injected current in bus two? How much is that? It's a generator. So the injected current in bus two should be given by the power generated. How much is that power generated? It's going to be 
P G two plus J Q G two divided by the voltage B two and all of these conjugate. And so this one is going to be P G two negative J Q G two divided by B two conjugate. That's the first one. Are we going to know B two? Yes or no? When we apply this procedure, we're assuming a flat start. So at the beginning, we know how much is B two. Do we know how much is PG2? Yes. Do we know how much is QG2? No. Why not? Because you're only given power and voltage. Voltage. We, instead of reactive power, we're specifying a voltage. The assumption is there must be a reactive power injected by this machine that will define that voltage. So we are fixing the voltage and letting this be a no. This is going to need to be adjusted to have the specified voltage. For the carbonate three, something similar. I will just write the equation. PG3 negative JQG3 divided by B2 conjugate. Yeah. So these need to be calculated because we don't know that value. Calculated. For I4, that is easy because the injected power is going to be, or four is going to be the negative of the power absorbed. So that's going to be negative PL minus because it's conjugate, but the reacted power injected in bus four is negative, is negative QL. So this becomes this one. These two values are fixed, is the specified value for the load. So we know this, these do not need to be calculated. The only thing that we need to use is whatever voltage before we have at the iteration. If we start from the flat start, it's going to be one angle zero, and these are going to be not. So that's how we are going to determine the current. Are we good? I said two things. This is one. How do we calculate the reacted power? If we know B and I, then we can get the imaginary part of that. All right, so what we're going to do to calculate the reactive power, we're going to use this equation for now. We don't have any other choice. So if we have the voltage, by using this multiplication, we can get the carbon, right? It's going to be calculated. If we have a flat star, we will have an estimated value of that carbon. Now, if we use the voltage we're using in that iteration and multiply by the current conjugate, then we have the complex power. So to calculate this uh, reactive power we need for these two guys here, first, we will calculate the uh, Q calculation, QG calculation. We're going to have the current injected in the vases estimated by this product. So we will have a specified voltage and we will calculate what is the current. Then we can get the complex power of this, which is going to be B, element by element multiplication of voltage and current conjugate.
maybe we can run this like this. There. And then Q calculated is going to be the imaginary part of this. So if we go to the second and third term, then we should obtain those values. Because we're going to do, repeat this iteratively for any, any iteration, we will use the current value of the voltages. So at iteration K, we will use those voltages and we will calculate the updated value for the voltages. There. What about B1? B1 is the slug bus. So this is known, this is given. We can determine those terms and those are going to be constant. What about the current I2, I3, and I4? Well, those need to be calculated as well here. And those are going to be given by this. This is K, this is K, this is K, and K, and K. So the current we will need to use, the, the power we need to use is that one here for this second bus and the third bus. And this is going to be K and K. And of course, the voltage here need to be a degradation K as well. These remain fixed, so we don't calculate this one. Are you with me? Do you remember this? So we have the equation for the carbon injected in the buses. We obtain this recursive equation for the voltages. We're going to have a flat start for the voltages. We're going to estimate the injected carbon. How? We're going to use that flat start for the voltage. Calculate what is the injected carbon, assuming that those are the voltage at the buses. We will have a element by element multiplication for the voltage multiplied by the current conjugate, we have a vector of complex power. We take the imaginary part of that, we get the reactive power calculated at each bus. We pick the value for the second and third bus, the second and, and third uh, row, and we replace it here for that iteration. We will use the flat start for the voltages. I'm sorry, this is the three. Flat the start for the voltages, and we obtain this current. We'll replace them there, evaluate, get a new value for the voltages, and repeat the process. Plug the new values here for the voltages, update the reactive power for the new iteration, replace it here, calculate the new current, plug them there, new voltage. We repeat this until we see that there is no change in the updated voltage. Yeah. What is no change? Well, we need to specify a tolerance. Let's do it together. So new file. And this is going to be function T Z. This is chapter six. This is the two machine infinite bus system. Yeah. So we save it. Yeah, there it is. And for now, I'm going to put 
anything here, T equal to zero and C to zero. So this doesn't complain. So the first part is going to be the power flow solution. We're going to use Gauss. What other technique can we use, Ryan? No, Gauss, Seidel. Okay, Seidel, yeah. Seidel, okay. And what would be the difference with what we describe? Uh, wait, so I'm sorry. Is, is Gauss and Gauss Siegel different things? Yes. Oh, I was not aware. <laughs> <laughs> so what I describe is just Gauss. So Gauss Siegel is, we always use the most updated voltage we have. So when you solve the first equation here, you will have up, updated voltage for D2. In the Gauss, nope, you use the flat start. You continue with that. But in Gauss, tell me what the pronunciation. Cetal. Okay. At least I assume that's what it is. Cetal. I said Cetal. That's, that's how uh, Dr. Simpson says. Soon, okay. Two against one. I don't know what is the pronunciation. I'm not confident, Cetal. so take whatever. Well, we're in the United States. We speak in English, so <laughs> you you guys should know. So in, in the Gauss Cetal, then you will use these voltage updated, not the flat side. What about V3? Well, the same thing. For V3, you will use the most updated voltage for V2, obtaining the same iteration and the same thing for V3. We're not going to, we can do that, but let's use just Gauss to make it simple. Um, even if we wanted to like simplify this more, could we use like uh, decoupled flow? Uh, we can do that too. Even? Any technique that helps to get the solution for voltages. And at the end, what, when you're going to know that you have the solution for voltages, whenever you calculate this, let's imagine you have. You, you have applied some technique and you got the voltages. Just replace that here. What you should get for the power? Exactly the power we have specified. So how much is that? 1.5 per unit for the active power here, 0 0.3 or eight? I thought that was eight. My mind thinks something in my hand does something else, 0 0.8. And here, 1.5 and 0 0.5 for the reactive power. If at the end, whatever technique you have, you have a vector for the bus voltages, these need to match what we specify, and we're fine. All right, so we will come back here and use the solution. Let's repeat this. So the first thing is you have a flat star. Let's call it voltage vector. And this is going to be, we have how many, uh, for the current, we need to have all the voltages. But as you can see here, we're not getting the equation for V1 because V1 is known, but, the grid has more four bases, so we need to use a vector with four terms. So we're going to use one, 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 and one. That is the what we call the flat star for the power flow solution. Now, when when we have that, then we need the y bus. Why don't before this we obtain the y bus? For the Y bus also, we need the data. So we need to get some function here, uh, Y bus. Um, do we need this? We have one, two, three, four lines. Let's call C one two, C one three, C two four, and Z 
three, four. Data, grid. And we need to specify the values of all of this. One, two, one, three, two, four, and three, four. Data, right here. Yeah, C12 is this. Z13 C24 and C34 Okay. So we have the impedances Right there, we're going to use it for the Y bus calculation. We can use something more sophisticated, but we're going to skip that here in, in this course. Uh, we're going to do it as we know. So we have the grid, and you remember how we get the diagonal of the Y bus. How much would, would be the diagonal for this term? One, one is the sum of all the admittances connected to that uh, bus. So you have the admittance of line one, two, and one, three. Okay, so Y bus, one, one, is going to be one over C, one, two, plus one over C, one, three. First order. Then you have Y bus, you have the term between one and two. It's the negative that means that of the term connecting one and two. So that's going to be negative of one C one two. Uh, then is the Y bus one three. Do we have that? Yes. And that is the negative of one over C one three. And one four, how much is the admittance between one and four? Zero, there is no term connecting those two buses. So because we know that the Y bus need to be four by four, what we can do is define initially this as a matrix of zeros. So we have that. And if we don't specify Y bus one four, it's because we are going to leave it as zero. Second row, two one, the matrix is symmetric. So we have the same than C one two, Y bus one two. Then we have Y bus two two, the diagonal. And we look here, that should be, the admittance one, two, and two, four. There, the admittance between two and three, nothing connected. So we need to include two and four. And that is negative of one over C two, four. Are you following me? Is that clear? Question? No. And then we continue with the three, the third row, and this is same matrix, so it's negative one C one three. Three and two are not connected, so we leave that at in zero, but we have three, three is the meters 
one, three, and three, four. And y bus three, four is the negative of that one. And finally, four, one is not connected. Four, two is the negative of one over z, two, four bus four three is the negative of c three four and bus four four is going to be two four and three four and if we do that then Line. Thank you. There. And let's check this. I'm going to put a breakpoint here. If you click there, and if you run the code, it will stop right there. So that will allow me to check this. So what you have is, oops, Y bus. That's the Y bus. Um, how do we make sure this is right? There is a, a command called a spy. You put a spy here, Y bus, it will, where is the plot? Darn it, there it is. It will show you all the non zero term of the Y bus. Does it make sense? Is it right? So the bus uh, one is connected to bus two and bus three. That's incorrect. For example, here bus three. Bus three is connected to bus one, not connected to bus two. You see, it's empty. Connected to bus, uh, bus uh, what did it say? Bus three. Co connected to bus four. Connected to bus one and bus four. So at least um, it seems that this is complete. Okay, let's go back to the code. And what we're going to do here, just repeat the process. You have the white bus now. We have a flat start. We will get this current. With this current, we're going to calculate the power, replace it here, have an updated value for the current injection and put this equation. And we will have a iteration, a while loop until we meet some error. Yeah, um, very quickly, let, let me, before we finish, because this is already the time. Um, so we have the white bus and what we can do is the current injected it's going to be y bus multiplied by b vector. So if we do that, then we can have the power vector, which is going to be b vector element by element multiplication. We put this dot here, period, or that. Um, we do that, and we have the the power. So. Let me stop this right here. Um, Q, Q vector, this imaginary part of S vector. Now let me stop this right there. There is a breakpoint. We call this again. Um, and we are there. Let me check what we have. S vector with a flat start is that one. Does it make sense? So the injected power for active power is zero. We just have some um, reacted power, but look, this is 
almost zero. Yeah, yeah that, that's what we should have for the flattest star. So we're going to continue here on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we should be done with this uh, two machine system. So again, be prepared with the, the laptop. And when we're done on Wednesday with this, we will continue with the next part that is oscillation or model analysis. We will calculate eigenvalues and see how we can use that to analyze the behavior of this system. Okay. Thank you, guys. Any question before we leave? No? Thank you, guys.